Keller, The Story of My Life, Chapter 13. It was in the spring of 1890 that I learned to speak. The impulse to utter audible sounds had always been strong within me. I used to make noises, keeping one hand on my throat while the other hand felt the movements of my lips. I was pleased with anything that made a noise and liked to feel the cat purr and the dog bark. I also liked to keep my hand on a singer's throat or on a piano when it was being played. Before I lost my sight and hearing, I was fast learning to talk, but after my illness, it was found that I had ceased to speak because I could not hear. I used to sit in my mother's lap all day long and keep my hands on her face because it amused me to feel the motions of her lips, and I moved my lips too, although I had forgotten what talking was. My friends say that I laughed and cried naturally. And for a while, I made many sounds and word elements, not because they were a means of communication, but because the need of exercising my vocal organs was imperative. There was, however, one word the meaning of which I still remembered, water. I pronounced it wawa. Even this became less and less intelligible until the time when Miss Sullivan began to teach me. I stopped using it only after I had learned to spell the word on my fingers. I had known for a long time that the people you about me used a me method of communication different from mine, and even before I knew that a deaf child could be taught to speak, I was conscious of dissatisfaction with the means of communication I already possessed. One who is entirely dependent upon the manual alphabet has always a sense of restraint, of narrowness. This feeling began to agitate me with a vexing, forward-featuring sense of a lack that should be filled. My thoughts would often rise up and beat up like birds against the wind, and I persisted in using my lips and voice. Friends tried to discourage this tendency, fearing lest it would lead to disappointment. But I persisted, and an accident soon occurred which resulted in the breaking down of this great barrier. I heard the story of Reginald Kata. In 1890, Miss L Mrs. Lamson who had been one of Laura Bergman's teachers and who had just returned from a visit to Norway and Sweden, came to see me. She told me of Regina Kanta, a deaf and blind girl in Norway who had actually been taught to speak. Mrs. Lampson had scarcely finished telling me about this girl's success before I was on fire with eagerness. I resolved that I, too, would learn to speak. I would not rest satisfied until my teacher took me, for advice and assistance, to Mrs. Sarah Fuller, principal of the Horace Mann School. This lovely, sweet-natured lady offered to teach me herself, and we began the 26th of March, 1890. Miss Fuller's method was this. She passed my hand lightly over her face and let me feel the position of her tongue and lips when she made a sound. I was eager to imitate every motion and in an hour had learned six elements of speech. M, P, A, S, T, I. Miss Fuller gave me eleven lessons in all. I shall never forget the surprise and delight I felt when I uttered my first connected sentence. It is warm. True, they were broken and stammering syllables, but they were human speech. My soul, conscious of a new strength, came out of bondage and was reaching through those broken symbols of speech to all knowledge and all faith. No deaf child who has earnestly tried to speak the words which he had ever heard, he had ne has never heard, to come out of the prison of silence, where no tone of love, no song of bird, no strain of music ever pierces the stillness, can forget the thrill of surprise, the joy of discovery which came over him when he uttered his first word. Only such a one can appreciate the eagerness with which I talk to my toys, to stones, trees, birds, and dumb animals, or the delight I felt when I call Mildred ran to me, or my dogs obeyed my commands. It is unspeakable boon to me to be able to speak in winged words that need no interruption. As I talked, happy thoughts fluttered up and out of my words that might perhaps have struggled in vain to escape my fingers. But it must not be supposed that I could really talk in this short time. I had learned only the elements of speech. Miss Fuller and Miss Sullivan could understand me, but most people would not have understood one word in a hundred. Nor is it true that, after I had learned these elements, I did the rest of the work myself. But for Miss Sullivan's genius, untiring perseverance and devotion, I could not have progressed as far as I have toward natural speech. In the first place, 
I labored night and day before I could be understood even by my most intimate friends. In the second place, I needed Miss Sullivan's assistance constantly in my efforts to articulate each sound clearly and to combine all sounds in a thousand ways. Even now she calls my attention every day to mispronounced words. All teachers of the deaf know what this means, and only they can all appreciate the peculiar difficulties with which I had to contend. In reading my teacher's lips, I was wholly dependent on my fingers. I had to use the sense of touch in catching the vibrations of the throat, the movements of the mouth, and the expression of the face. And often this sense was at fault. In such cases, I was forced to repeat the words or sentences, sometimes for hours, until I felt the proper ring in my own voice. My work was practice, practice, practice. Discouragement and weariness cast me down frequently. But the next moment, the thought that I should soon be at home and show my loved ones what I had accomplished spurred me on, and I eagerly looked forward to their pleasure in my achievement. My little sister will understand me now was a thought stronger than all obstacles. I used to repeat ecstatically, I am not dumb now. I could not be despondent when I, while I anticipated the delight of talking to my mother and reading her responses from her lips. It astonished me to find out how much easier it is to talk than to spell with the fingers, and I discarded the manual alphabet as a medium of communication on my part. But Miss Sullivan and a few friends still use it in speaking to me, for it is more convenient and more rapid than lip reading. Just here, perhaps, I had better explain our use of the manual alphabet, which seems to puzzle people who do not know us. One who reads or talks to me spells with his hand, using the single-hand method alphabet generally employed by the deaf. I place my hand on the hand of the speaker so lightly as to not impede its movements. The position of the hand is easy to feel as to see. I do not feel each letter any more than you see each letter separately when you read. Constant practice makes the fingers very flexible, and some of my friends spell rapidly, about as fast as an expert writes on a typewriter. The mere spelling is, of course, no more a conscience act than it is writing. When I made speech on my own, I could not wait to go home. At last, the happiest of happy moments arrived. I had made my homeward journey, talking constantly to Miss Sullivan, not for the sake of talking, but determined to improve to the last minute. Almost before I knew it, the train stopped at the Tuscumbia station, and there on the platform stood the whole family. My eyes fill with tears now as I think of my mother pressed me close to her, speechless and trembling with delight, taking in every syllable, syllable that I spoke, while little Mildred seized my friend, free hand and kissed it and danced, and my father expressed his pride and affection in a big silence. It was as if Isaiah's prophecy had been fulfilled in me. The mountains and the hills shall break forth before you into singing, and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. No, that was really good. <clears throat> that was Helen Keller, chapter 13. It's really a great ending. <clears throat>